Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today on the Focus on Why podcast, I am joined by Professor Laura Serent, OBE. And Laura is my first female OBE on the podcast, and I'm very excited. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a, a, my absolute pleasure. And it is, I don't know what you got your OBE for. So is that a good place to start or is that somewhere along the journey? Yeah, well, that might be a good place to start. I mean, my response may be, I don't know why I got it for either, but then that's probably not the right response. The official reason why I got the OBE, uh, which I got in 2018, was for services to nursing and health policy. So that's the official, if you were to look it up, that's the services to is usually how they, they frame it when you get an OBE or an award. So services to nursing and health policy. In, in reality, what that means is um, a lot of my work through my career so far has focused on health and health inequalities. And so that's kind of where it comes from. And the policy work that I've done both in the UK and internationally has also focused on how we can have policies which give people an equal chance or a better chance of health and life. And how long have you been working in that industry? I qualified as a nurse in 1982. So I have been, and I'm still on the register as a nurse. And so that's been a good over 35 years now. And so I've been doing that work a long time. And that's the route, I suppose, that led me to my broader work, which is around uh, diversity and inclusion. I suppose if I was trying to sum up two words that I think would, would, I suppose, link to my why, but also link to my professional and personal work um, kind of ethos, it's around equal chance. Equal chance. And equal chance to what? Equal chance to, to, to life, to health. I, I think my focus has always been on health and life chances because I think I've always been struck by how sometimes almost as an accident of birth, shall we say. People have differing chances of becoming, of succeeding, and really, I think, fulfilling and living the kind of life that they wish to lead or they were destined to, to lead. And why, why has that sort of come to the forefront for you? Uh, it's something that I think that I've had all my life. I think um, I, was, I was brought up in a very bog standard working class family. Um, you know, people around me um, were, we were very equal in that sense. I mean, we're talking, you know, in the 1960s. So, you know, there wasn't any internet or social media to show us what other people had or didn't have. Um, your world was the people around you, I suppose. And um, I was born in Nottingham and the area of Nottingham I was born in was um, a, a relatively poor working class area as, as looking at it now as an adult that obviously wasn't for me that wasn't how it felt when I was younger I never felt poor I never felt disadvantaged as a young child because everybody around me was the same we all had or didn't have whatever we had or we didn't have and we were there was a, an equality around if you know where we were and but it wasn't as I as I grew up I became much more aware of things like how people had better chances or maybe better access to food or slightly better clothing, et cetera, and better health. You know, I suppose I noticed the adults around me, um, they were all very hard working class people and worked in the, the pits at the time or in the steelworks later on. And so their health was affected much by their occupations. So those sort of things struck me. And that's when I first became interested in this idea of how, where we live and uh, the situations we're in, the social context we brought in does impact on our health and our chances. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so growing up, you felt that you, you didn't feel poor mm. and you didn't feel that there were, you were disadvantaged in any way. Yeah. How did it make a difference when you, you, you suddenly 
did tip over that balance? How did you start feeling? Actually, I it was a bit of confusion, really. I, I think when it first struck me was when I actually was doing my nurse training, which was like by that time I started my training in 1982. So one of the things that struck me, the more at the time in 1982, I'm sure many of your listeners are a lot younger than I am and may not remember, so this might be a history lesson. But in 1982, one of the things that came out was something called the Black Report. And the Black Report was the first report that looked at social inequalities in great detail in, in the UK as they stood. So it talked about things like social policy, it talked about how people born in the same city at different sides of the same city had different life expectancy and et cetera, et cetera. And when it talked about some of those things that gave people a lower life expectancy or lower health, ex healthy life expectancy, I read that and I thought, but that's, that was my life. You know, that's what we had. We did those things. And that's when it first struck me. And I hadn't actually made that strong connection between my experiences as a child and growing up and having less chance of healthy or long life. Not until I actually was, was in that situation. And you ask how I felt about that. I think I felt surprised. I didn't feel, I still didn't feel in any way I'd missed anything because my child was very happy. You know, as I say, we were, you know, had lots of friends. We, you know, it was a very close community. It was a very supportive community in that sense of, and you know, you knew people down the streets or along the street, across the road, people helped each other out. Um, but it 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 just struck me that I you know I hadn't actually made the links between having that as an as an experience of growing up and then impacting on myself as an adult or as an older person further along the line. And do you think it is down to just chance? I think there's I think there's a mixture of uh, nature and nurture. There's an element of chance in there in terms of, you know, we, we don't have any control about where we're born or, or the families that we're born into or even for, to a large extent, some of the things that happen to us through life. But there's also, also comes with that, comes with the, the, the experiences, comes with the, the I suppose, the, the tools or resources that we have to help us through those things. So everybody facing the same adversity or the same challenge doesn't have the same experience of it. And I think, you know, one of the things that's, that struck me, I suppose, much more recently is, I suppose, as we're now in, in COVID-19 land, is the idea that we're all in it together. And yes, we are all in it together, but we're all in a different, to get, in a different part of it, in a different way. It impacts on us differently. So there's an element of chance, which is something that we can't necessarily, uh, we can't affect in, in that sense. Um, we can't affect whether something happens to us, but how we approach it, how we deal with it, how we're able or enabled to deal with it is less about chance and it's more about politics. And when I say politics, people sometimes get a bit nervous. Oh, I don't mean politics in terms of political parties. That's not my, my the way... I speak about this. I'm speaking about politics in a sense of equality, in, in terms of equality's work. And politics is simply about distribution of resources. Who gets access to resource? Who is considered when determining the need for resource? Whose stories count? Whose experiences are prioritized? That's what, so it's the politics of health. And that was something I first came across in the Black Report, the politics of health is about the distribution of resources. And I suppose what I would go even further to say is the politics of life chance is about distribution of resources. And there are three main types of resources that may, that, that, that impact on health and life chances and well-being to, to a great extent. And they are the resource of time, the resources of support, the resources of, and the resources of investment, you know, of actual financial um, investment. And I think those three things and how they are, how we experience those in our lives affect the politics of our health and our life chances. And that's what gives us a lesser or greater chance of well-being. So that, 
particular report was massively influential on the rest of your life. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That that kick-started this journey around looking at equal chance of inclusion, of diversity and of equity. Um, and, and I think they are, you know, diversity, inclusion and equity, or at least inclusive practice towards that goal is the thing that's that's kind of um, shaped and underpins all my um, professional work and certainly my personal ethos. And when did you feel that you were able to affect some sort of change? I think I'd, I'd started, I started getting involved in, um, in things called something called health action zones. Again, another history lesson for people who, who, who may be slightly younger than me, at least. Um, health action zones came out much more in the late 80s, early 90s. And that was where there was a push to look at the, um, what was the word, the, the currency and the, if you like, the value and the resource that there was within communities. So rather, and this is health, this isn't health in terms of having already having a sickness. This is health in terms of what we would now call well-being and social and emotional well-being of people and communities. And health action zones harness the energy and the resources within different communities to help promote well-being and it, within that community and certainly social cohesion and social inclusion and all the things that, that we, we, we give all the labels to. We didn't necessarily have names for those things at that time, but that's what Health Action Zones did. And I started doing work, work involuntarily within Health Action Zones where I live at that, at that time. I think, I suppose on an individual basis, I could say that from doing my nurse training from 1982 onwards, that I affect, I could see that I affected advances for individuals or individual families, if you like, through the, the care uh, work that I did. And I worked very much in community and public health as well. And that also helped support communities to do that. Um, much of my early, very early nursing was in gynecology. Um, and I particularly worked on uh, in the fertility clinics. And again, that's that, you know, your listeners may May, you know, some of your listeners may have had the experience of living through or managing uh, infertility. And again, that's a different kind of support where I feel like I affected change. Not so much in terms of the provision of medical treatment, because that, you know, that is part of what the clinics are, but actually understanding and supporting individuals and couples through the emotional journey and process that that, that, that takes out of, out of them and their families. And then um, my work moved on to broader areas around sexual health. And I particularly worked with um, around HIV and AIDS. So in the mid eighties to early nineties in, in the UK, that was when we hit the peak of a lot of the HIV and AIDS work. And I worked then um, both in a paid capacity and voluntarily with organizations that work with people living with HIV. And again, that's around, that again has, it's that overlap between a medical need or clinical need for support and then also that how do you support people socially and emotionally in communities and I think in that period of time through my work with infertility and then also the work through HIV and AIDS one of the things that struck me again was how much that the politics of health and equal chance also tied into brought up um, issues of the worthy and the unworthy so very much particularly around the HIV and AIDS work, there was something that were, in terms of the social message that went out at that time in the media and across about the deserving and the undeserving sick or poor. And I think um, that that was something that struck me then. So, you know, all these things, if you like, culminate in, culminated in, in building on what was my initial kind of feelings around um, health, around equity, around life and equal chance. And actually, I think that's what's driven a lot of my work moving forward. The key thing that struck me, I think, certainly from my work around HIV and AIDS was that, you know, on the news and in the newspapers, I would read about, you know, kind of the, the, the kind of undeserving sick and actually how people were to blame for their illness and to blame for their conditions because of the nature of the lifestyles they chose, inverted commas, to, to lead. 
And yet at the same time, I was working on a daily basis with people, groups and communities who were just trying to find a way to manage their health and live their normal lives that they wanted to live, just like everybody else, um, in a face of quite a lot of moral and social backlash against them as a group of people. Um, so there, were, there, there was that there was that tension, if you like, between the stories that were being told in the media and in the headlines and the stories of individuals, of families and communities that I was hearing on a daily basis. And that from that to me is where the idea of this whole idea of revealing hearing silences came from, which is, which is core to, to, to me and my work. Because from my own very early experience right back, you know, reading the Black Report, through to my professional experience working in healthcare, the stories of the people that I lived with, that I was part of and that I worked with, were not the ones that you were hearing in the media, on the news, and they were not the ones that were being used or taken, being, being um, taken into account of in order to make policies or strategies or um, decisions about services or about for even for businesses about what what they would do and that was where my interest came into the importance of voice and the importance of being heard and that's fascinating and and just hearing the the conflict and the tension that was created around from media around from lifestyle choices and uh, uh, but you had the other side of that you were behind the scenes and and sort of on on the ground you know you were right yeah. there and how I mean, how different were the perspectives from the the media reality to the the physical reality that you were experiencing they were they were absolutely vastly different i mean you have to remember that at the time there was a big there was a huge backlash morally people were i mean at the height of certainly around the height of the hiv and aids um a pandemic we're in another pandemic at this time but here, at that pandemic you know people lost their jobs people um you know wouldn't let their children play with other people's children because they thought that because that per that child belonged to a family or had someone in their family who belonged to one of the five risk groups as we as we say people would cross the road people were 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 beaten up people had their houses firebombed. You, you can't imagine the level of anxiety, distress, and persecution that many people faced simply because of their sexuality, of their racial group, or because of the, the, the work that they did, or because of a condition that they happened to be born with. You know, for example, in terms of people who contracted HIV via blood transfusions before we screen them. So this, this, is the, this is the level of what we were living with at the time. And then to, to work to support people at those times of distress, living with those conditions who've been made homeless, whose landlords have thrown them out, who have gone to work and be told that they, you know, they were not no longer required. Um, and then just trying to, to live a life, to, to work, to pay their bills, to feed their children, to go to work, to do what everybody else was doing. And then on the news or in the paperwork to read about, you know, kind of, how, you know, stories of, of them having depraved characteristics or in somehow, you know, and the whole being out of control or, you know, choosing or bringing on this plague. Words like this were used, bringing on the plague to as a risk to everybody else. There was, there couldn't be a greater contrast. And how did people move from that position of being incredibly fearful and obviously operating out of that sort of context into becoming more accepting and for us to, to now be in the state where we are in the position to accept people in society again? And, you know, well, not everybody was in that case. I'm just talking about the sort of smaller groups or, or maybe it was the majority that were sort of pigeonholing these people. It was, it was, it was, um, I, I, you know, I didn't, I couldn't tell you the data about whether it was a majority or minority. What I can tell you that it was tangible. It was large enough to actually affect people's lives on a daily basis. And I think that's the most important thing. Interestingly, um, the point I think in which the tide started to shift was when it became absolutely clear from the data and from infection rates that actually there were not, there was no such thing as five risk groups. That it wasn't because you belonged to these five particular groups of people that you were at risk and everybody else was okay. 
when mainstream people started to become infected, unfortunately, with HIV and, and die from AIDS-related conditions, um, that's when the tide started to shift because people started to understand that it, it was about everybody. And, you know, it's quite strange in a way to think about that in relation to the pandemic we are. That's the nature of pandemics, you know. They start in a, usually they highlight areas uh, or groups in the community or in society who are usually overlooked. So it will, although it, it will attack or show up first in places of, not, when I say weakness, I don't mean weakness in the people, but actually places where there is le a lack of provision or support. And then it actually shows that it spreads to everybody. And that's no different for what we're living now with COVID-19. It showed up in the particular communities or particular countries, and you think, well, it's something over there. And what you quickly realize, actually, it's everybody. It needs a change, a wholesale change of everybody in order to change that. So what starts as a quiet, silent story, something that is, and for me, a silent story is something that is under-researched or not usually highlighted or little known or sometimes just um, attributed to a small group of people. And then what you realise is that it, it, it basically just shows a spark. It flags up something that we need to take notice of or that we need to take account of. And if we don't, what happens then, it becomes something much larger and you can see the consequences of it in a, on a much bigger scale. So that's when things started to change. And then, of course, there was a push, as there always is, for vaccines. You have to remember, again, that when I was involved early on in, in HIV and AIDS work, there was no such thing as HIV. We hadn't isolated the virus. We were very similar to where we are with COVID in that, People were dying and, and people were contracting the condition and we hadn't got a vaccine, the inverted commas. Once we actually were able to isolate the HIV virus, then actually we could work could then continue in relation to developing what we now know are combination therapies. And now we have pre-exposure prophylaxis. And HIV in my lifetime has moved from being a death sentence to a chronic condition. So people live with it rather than die of it. But the but the sometimes the 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 medical change or the the the, the treatment change takes a long time. And but the but the damage and some of the impact happens in the social sphere. It happens in the social context, it happens in the politics context of health, in terms of who we are, where money is spent, who gets the support, who is identified as being to blame or not, and whose stories count. So this is a difficult thing that I'm I'm hearing here. That obviously there are there is a limited resource in time, limited resource in support, and a limited resource in mm -hmm. investment, and and there does have to be a decision made at a Absolutely. political level. So how do you work out? who is deserving and who is sort of lesser deserving or who is worthy and who is sort of not worthy of receiving those three resources? I think you, you've actually hit, hit nail on the head, Amy, and this is kind of, this is the, the, the reason for getting broad stories or broad voices in any, in any scenario, is that there is no such thing as a, as a bottomless pit of any resource. And, you know, there isn't in our individual lives. We make decisions constantly about what to do, how to prioritise. It doesn't mean that other things are not important. It means at this point, in this situation, in this context, what is most important? Where should I put my efforts? That's really the, the question. We do it in our personal lives, don't we, as well as our professional lives. And the same thing happens here in terms of the politics around health and resources, is where should we put our efforts now? But if let, let's just imagine for a moment that those decisions always have to be made and they're based on evidence, information that we gather from w whichever sources in all different ways. Some of that information, some of that evidence is countered. So it's about measures or levels. Some of that information is about understanding. So it's about the context and um, experiences. Now, if I only ask speakers, as we were in a speaking situation, if I only ask speakers or I only ask people who live on one side of town what is required and I only use that information, that's the only information I have, 
to help me make a choice, then my choices will only speak to or address the needs of that particular profession, speakers, or those people who live in that particular area. Everybody else, it may or may not fit them by chance. And there will be some people, it definitely won't fit because they will be in a completely different situation. And, and so that's why I focus on the need for a broad range of voices and to listen to the silent bits, the bits where you don't ask. So if often in business, in organizations, or even sometimes in families, we always ask the same person for advice, for information. We don't ask anybody else, so we get one view. And if we, can, if we keep getting the same responses or, and we keep getting the same outputs, things only work in a certain way or we can't understand why something never works when we do it. You know, we all know the, the, the old adage, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So the answer sometimes lies in the people, the experiences or the information that you don't usually take account of. It, and that's the silence. So the answer lies in the silence so what i've tried to do with my work is encourage people when i'm coaching if it's individuals um, or groups if i'm coaching if it in speaking or working with businesses if it's in a business development sense to help them to look at the silent bits to identify that and what they've already got because you already have the resources you've already got all that information you don't you very you very rarely need extra information but you re- need to look at what you've got diff- slightly differently. So what is your information not telling you? Who is it? Who do you know exists that you're not listening to or you've not heard of or you have no idea what even what they think? And that gives you a different um, opportunity to use your range of resources better, whether they're as an individual or, or as a group or even as a business. And I think that's something that people find really hard to to take on board, that they already have the answers. They're looking for this sort of magic answer somewhere. And and actually, they do have the, the knowledge there, but they're just not listening or looking in the right places. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even more so these days, I mean, you know, post-COVID, post uh, in, in the wake of all the Black Lives Matter, the range and the, the, the kind of increase in interest in inequality and diversity and inclusion that people do, you know, in, in the range of things that, you know, it's easy to go, okay, what I need is I need a trainer on equality and diversity to come in and train my staff and then we'll all be, then we'll all be sorted, you know, and actually, do you really, is that really what you need? You know, training may or may not be what you need, but you kind of have to do a bit of a forensic first, just as we use in coaching, just as we use in any kind of planning. You've kind of got to do a forensic of what you've already got to find out where your issue or where your challenge actually is before you jump straight to, to the answer of, of, of coaching. Um, if I give you a, a, an example from my health experience, it, um, from what something that happened years ago, when I was um, working in uh, fertility, I was working in reproductive health. I was working in gynecology. So that covered gynecology. It covered maternity up to 22 weeks. And then it covered infertility. That's basically what gynecology covers. And we used to run clinics and we used to spend time with the, with the midwives and uh, et cetera, just because of the overlap of the services. And there was a decision that one of the things that we noticed uh, when I was working, this was in, in Sheffield at the time, was there were very few uh, Muslim women who came to the kind of, parental classes and, and things like that, the, and particularly the groups that we have for women support. And they, they couldn't really understand why, because I was saying, well, these are women-only groups, so, you know, there isn't an issue around, surely and culturally that should be fine, but why were they not coming to the groups? And they decided that one of the reasons they weren't coming to the group was that the groups were mainly in the in, in the middle of the afternoon, and they felt, well, maybe they'd got multiple generational support, they need, it wasn't working. So they decided, well, why don't we just have a group just for Muslim women, just as a trial to see if that would encourage more women to, to come to. Great idea, because you know, you'd think they've noticed the, the diversity of the people they've got going. They know within the city that there is a great population that isn't accessing the service. Fabulous. So they decided and they put a group on for six weeks at half past six in the evening, you know, thinking, well, that'll be after, you know, work that have support, they'll be able to come to the group. Nobody came. And after a couple of weeks, they said, well, there's obviously no demand for this. So we're not, you know, we're not going to run this group 
penny more. Until we sat down and, uh, well, until I was sitting with them and I was saying to them, well, why didn't this, I don't understand why your group didn't work. You know, because I know many, work with many um, Asian women's groups. They have evening sessions, they have group things and people come to it, they're really well. Until they noticed that what they, what, what they had done was actually put the group on in the middle of Ramadan. Because they didn't make any reference to anybody who any, they didn't ask any Muslim women when would be the best time to have the group, what would work well, etc. And of course, the timing meant it was just after the end of the fasting where the people would be preparing food, because obviously you've got a window to eat, etc, etc. And this is what I mean about, you know, the answers are there, the people are there. You've got to, you can't go straight to what well, we need to do training as an answer to everything. The answer is actually, we need to maybe speak to people, hear the people and say, what would work best? This is where the issue is. What would work best? What would help you to come to our group? What would help you to engage with this? And yet the efforts were put in the wrong place. The efforts were put in, it, almost the cart came before the horse really. So they have got, you know, um, information leaflets in different languages they looked at different things they looked at the content of the sessions but not the organization wow well there we go so services to nursing and health policy I think I might get an idea now where where that's all come from <laughs> but, <laughs> but take yourself back to 1982 why nursing oh gosh now there's a funny story <laughs> um when I was um, younger, when I was before I went to university, I always wanted to be a doctor. Um, I was going to do medicine, and because I thought, that one, in my experience, that the important person in my community was the GP. Going to do medicine, I was going to be a GP, and then I'd be able, there'd be more to help and understand not just people's treatment, but also the communities they lived in, and to be able to take that into account to give help and support. Um, I was fortunate to be very good at school. I did my O levels. I did uh, my A levels. I applied for medical school. I was accepted, got an interview for medical school. So it wasn't a case of, you know, and I went, um, at that time, we, you, you get offered a place and you'd go for an open day and they'd do a bit of an interview with you and, and you'd decide whether that was your right choice. I did that. And when I went to the open day, I didn't like it. And the thing that struck me most the open day wasn't about medicine so much, but I was sitting, I remember sitting in a corridor with um, some of the second year medical students who'd been showing a group of us around and everything else. And I went down on my own. I mean, those days, very few people's parents came to an open day with them at all. You know, mine certainly didn't. They put me, they put me on a train to London and I went to, to this interview. And I was the only person who didn't come from a private school in that interview which didn't bother me to an extent until one of the second year students said to me, oh, well, where do you, which school do you go to? So I told them, and such the comprehensive I went to, and they went, you go to a comprehensive? And literally the whole room looked at me and they all went, she goes to a comprehensive? And they all stared at me and I just thought, these are not my people. Oh. <laughs> and I went, and you'd, you'd kind of think that maybe, and I remember going then into the discussion to the, to the interview, and the more I went round with and looked at this, the more the conversation was about how, you know, you do your training, and if you're really good, you'll become a consultant. It was very hospital focused. You'll become a consultant and then you won't have to do, you know, basically you won't have to be away with the patients all the time. That's what I heard. And I surely know from health that that's not the case in terms of that's not what, you know, the consultants do necessarily. That's not, but that's what I heard. And it seemed to me, it just didn't feel like the thing I wanted to do. Because for me, my, my, the thing pushing me was as I get on and as I progress, I will have more, I'll be more enabled to help individuals and communities, not more able to be you know elite in a way and uh, I went into uh, the interview session and I told them I changed my mind I said, I've changed my mind now I don't want to do this and they went well, what do you mean and they were like really shocked because obviously you know getting into medicine was like a big wowie and I was like no this just doesn't feel like what I'm supposed to be doing I didn't at that time know a great deal about lots of other um, um health careers I had got nurses in my family and um, because coming from the Caribbean uh, nursing is a very highly rated profession very very highly rated um, but I wanted to go to university and at that time nursing wasn't 
tra the training happened in hospitals predominantly. It wasn't really largely done within universities, but I had wanted to go to university. It was something I wanted to do. So I went home um, on the train, told my mother and parents that I no longer was doing medicine. Well, you can imagine, because they were, yeah, they were so proud that I was going to be a doctor about this. And, you know, I think my mother took to her bed, you know, but anyway, you know, not, not, not physically, but in her mind, she kind of, you know, anyway, they just said, well, whatever you want to do is fine. And I went to school the next, at the, at the next week and told them that I wasn't going to do medicine anymore. And then one of my tutors said to me, well, you know that they do nursing now in universities but not many places so I looked it up and there were about five places that did nursing and at that time you could actually go back into it wasn't UCAS it was called Upper. you could go back and change your choices and I changed my choices to to degree nursing and I went to interviews for that and got offered places um, in four different universities to do a nursing degree and um, I chose to go to Sheffield City Polytechnic and um, it wasn't even a, a great, people say to me, why did you choose Sheffield as opposed to other places? And I can tell you, the reason I chose Sheffield was that when I went for my interview in Sheffield, it was a sunny day. And when I went for my interviews at the other places, it poured with rain. And it was only on that basis did I choose. You know, people say to me, oh, you must have been a really hard choice. And Sheffield is really great, very diverse city, has a whole range of issues of many cities around inequalities. And people say, oh, it was a really good fit with the inequalities. So I was thinking, well, it wasn't really that deep a thought. You know, as an 18-year-old, my thought was, oh, well, it's nice and sunny here, so I'll come here. Not that we had many sunny days in, in the wilds of Yorkshire while I was actually on the course, but that was the reason why I chose nursing. And I wonder whether... That interview in London sparked something deeper in, inside you about that equal chance, you know, yes. from a comprehensive. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, in, in at the time, uh, for those who can remember, at the time, there was a great push to try and increase the number of what they call working class children going to and um, comprehensive uh, educated children going to universities and getting good degrees, etc. And But I just kind of thought, well, I don't, this is not, you know, I could, I could have gone to um, medical school, and I'm sure I would have, been, I would have performed. I'm not, I hadn't got any queries about my ability, you know, educationally to to do that. But I just thought this is not where I want to make my impact. These are not the people I necessarily want to spend my time with, and I just certainly didn't want to spend years battling with people or making an excuse or justifying my position. That wasn't where I wanted to put my efforts. But what I did, what, what nursing gave me, and certainly doing a degree nursing gave me, was actually a much broader view of the things that impact on health rather than the focus on learning how to treat illness. And that was the difference. This was very much about how do we, how do we support and engage and promote wellness and well-being of people and populations rather than how do we treat illness? And then that, and it always felt for me as a better fit. And, you know, and in my, through my nursing career, I've traveled the world. I've been to various, most continents. I've been to the World Health Organization. I've presented internationally. I've worked with governments nationally and internationally. I've got an OBE, um, you know, and I've been able to impact policy. And I think that has been a real big thing for me because by impacting policy, and there are several policies that I've contributed to or worked with or provided evidence for, um, including the, the first HIV and sexual health policy for England, which was in 2001. And, um, you know, and I think by that way, I feel like I've been able to have a greater impact on the health and the life chances and equal chance for a greater number of people. Because I feel like being at that those tables where decisions are made where evidence is produced and being able to scrutinize and say but what about the experiences of this community or that community or people with this experience or people from this side of town I feel that that has actually at least given a greater number of people even the possibility of an equal chance or be having their story considered in making a decision around resources and what impact can you make as a speaker now? I think for me, my speaking now has sort of moved broader than just health because it is around um, it is around inclusive practice. And my experiences in health, my experiences in working in policy and around that have really 
enable me to help and, and my coaching enable me to help individuals to think about how do they best use the, the resources that idea of self-agency for individuals where do they need to put their efforts to actually have an equal chance of realizing the the life and the health chance and 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 living the kind of life and the well-being that they want for themselves or for their family and certainly from a business point of view you know if we if the moral argument is already won about we want to be much more inclusive in business because we know we know financially that businesses that are more inclusive or have more inclusive practice actually do better financially as well so it's it's a, it's a business decision but sometimes people don't know how to do that so what what i'm able to do is in the same way that i did with 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 national governments etc and 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 other businesses is actually to help them to ask the right questions of themselves and to identify the stories and the information in the data they already have and to be able to use that to action plan and decide where they're going to put their efforts in order to get better results or to achieve what they want to achieve. Um, and that's where this, the speaking comes in. So I'm very much, uh, as a speaker, um, focused on um, self-agency on leading for diversity and also hearing silences and that's all about hearing stories the use the information and seeing what we don't usually see and if somebody would like to get hold of you and get you involved in their business how would they reach out to you laura well the, the all my contact details are on my website i do have a website it's uh, lauraserent.com so it's very easy if you google i am the only laura serent so you don't you, you I'm very hard to mix up with anybody else. And my details are on there. I'm on LinkedIn as well. And, and I'm always there just as my name. So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Um, and obviously through my website. And, and on the website, you can read a bit more about my, you know, my um, Silent Speaks business model. Um, you can read a bit more about myself and my background. Um, I've also got a podcast as well and um, a YouTube channel. So there's enough spaces to find me. Well, I'll make sure that all of those links get included in the show notes. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a real privilege to have you here and, and hear about your contributions, your services to nursing and health policy, because it, it really has been incredible. And there's been a, gr a great, a vast sort of experience there that people will be able to sort of take on board. It's been a bit of a history lesson, to be fair. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's always a bit it's always a bit ter terrible I've got to that age where my life is now part of people's history lessons <laughs> mind you it's a it's a it's a blessing denied to many people isn't it so I've lived long enough that part of my experience is in the history books <laughs> absolutely so a final word for our audience please Laura I think my final words I'll leave you is about the importance of speaking and having and telling your story and what I would say is that, you know, we, we've all got stories to tell and we've all got a voice. And if we don't use our voice and tell our own stories, other people will speak for us. And at best, they'll mistell our stories and get it wrong. But at worst, they'll render us silent. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson, and if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20-minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrollinson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.